for selling our uh, workshop. Uh, we've got a, uh, uh, and a special welcome for, for, for those of you who have come a, a long way to, uh, to participate. We've got a, uh, a very uh, sort of eclectic lineup of, uh, of speakers and, and topics, and I think this is uh, um, this is great because it is a uh, an indication of uh, you know the wide variety of uh, applications that we have for uh, uh, selling and being involved, and also uh, some very interesting talks coming up on on development of, in the selling community, both of software and, and standards. Um, so first of all, I'd like to. Uh, uh, Thank uh, Andre uh, and Kate, where is Kate? Uh, who have done the bulk of the organising, especially Andre, who uh, has pulled everything together. So if things go extremely well, which I'm sure they will, then you know, we, can, uh, we can thank Kate and, uh, and Andre. And if things fall over, which I hope they won't, then uh, it's because the rest of us haven't put enough effort into uh, Ensuring that is so. So thanks, uh, thanks to Andre and Kate, um, and also uh, thank you very much to uh, Morris Wilkins Centre and the Auckland Bioengineering Institute for coming to support uh, for this meeting. As I say, we've got a, quite a uh, an interesting and eclectic set of, uh, of sessions uh, spanning the, the the two days. Um, we're going to start off. This uh, uh, workshop, with the most demanding, at least technically uh, demanding, uh, presentation, because uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, coming by, from uh, from Germany uh, by wrong people. Um, um, and uh, hope. Sorry. <laughs> Which one? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, and Martin Martin Shah. That's right. Sorry. I didn't realize it was the, the one talking. Um, so there'll be plenty of time for for discussions uh, both during the, uh, the the sessions. You know, I think we hope that these will be interactive, uh, but also between the sessions during the morning tea and lunch uh, and afternoon tea times. And just a reminder also that uh, there is a self-funded dinner tonight. Um, I think. Uh, if you're going to come on at dinner, you should already have uh, let uh, uh, Andre know. If not, uh, let him know as soon as possible. And as Andre mentioned, everything is going to be recorded on this, uh, this camera here. We have that live uh, podcast at the moment, and it will be up on YouTube uh, um, for reference later. So. If you do have copyright or confidential material, um, just bear that in mind, uh, and you know perhaps uh, take it out or uh, um, speak very uh, vaguely about uh, what it is uh, you don't want everyone else to know, at least outside of this room. Uh, please upload your presentations and send Andre a link to add to the website and meeting report. So Andre is here. He's the man that we need to uh, to give this stuff uh, to. So that's it. I think we'll move straight on because we're in short time. Straight on to the first presentation. Is Martin going first? Martin first. Yeah. Okay. Okay, my bad. Uh, you probably need to unmute your microphone. I think we're ready for you. Yeah, it's quite hard to understand you, but I uh, hope the other direction is okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I can hear me twice. Twice. Just 
Test. Test. Oh, what's... Do you still hear me? We can hear you, but we'll turn off our microphone while you're speaking, just to, to cut out an echo. Okay, Joe, so I just start my presentation. Yeah. presentation. Um, first of all, I've uploaded my slides, so if you have trouble reading my slides, you can download them from our website. Um, there's an announcement in the news section. Um, yeah, however. Hi, everyone. My name is Martin Charm. I'm doing my PhD in the SAMS group at the University of Rostock, and today I want to present Beavis and Butthead. Um, that's our approach to implement version control for computational models. First of all, I'll shortly introduce you to our group and what we are doing. Then we'll have a look at the modeling workflow and how our tools may support modelers. I'll also demonstrate our prototypic implementation. Then I'll declare some requirements to integrate Beavis and Butthead, and I'll end up with a summary. As I already mentioned, I'm part of the SAMS group, and we are developing methods and techniques to improve the management of computational models. We've implemented some prototypes for different aspects that can be integrated in existing platforms and repositories. We care, for example, for the storage of models and model-related information. Currently, everything is stored in simple XML files or relational databases. Our approach is to store the data in graph-based databases, which better reflects the network structure of the underlying models. We are also developing some search algorithms and implemented a ranked retrieval using techniques from the information retrieval. We extended these methods and also store meta information, for instance, from ontologies to use um, them where, during the search process. As far as I know, Ron will explain these techniques in more detail later on. Last but not least, we also care for version control of computational models. As the title of my presentation already indicates, this is more or less my discipline and the upcoming slides will deal with that topic. Yes. As you might have heard, we are interested in understanding biological systems. Models model the notion of the biological system they are investigating. And here I visualize the generic chemical reaction with one compound R that is degraded into two products, B and C. And this reaction is stimulated by a modifier D. Typically, researchers uh, continuously gain new insights into their systems, and thus the model are updated regularly. Looking at my example, it turns out that B isn't a product anymore of the reaction R, but E is. Uh, followed by another reaction S where E becomes B. Such updates occur frequently and consequently modelers end up with a bunch of directories and numerous files and thus it's quite hard to track the changes and to understand what has been done between two versions of a model, even for the researcher who, who built the model. So our aim becomes clear, we want to disentangle the history of a model. First of all, we've developed a Java library called Beavis to map hierarchically structured content. Beavis is able to detect the differences between two versions of a computational model encoded in standardized formats. It matches unchanged or moved entities in model documents and identifies inserts and deletes. As a result of the difference detection, 
Beavis produces a diff containing all changes that occurred between both versions. This diff is also encoded in XML and can be used to grasp changes which occurred between this, these versions. Since the diff produced by Beavis is far away from being human readable, we've implemented a web-based interface called Butthead. Butthead is able to understand the output of Beavis and converts it to some human readable formats, including the highlighted chemical reaction network and some text-based summary of the differences. Butthead acts as a bridge and can be integrated in existing repositories. Okay, let's have a look at our prototyping implementation. If you're logged into Butthead, you can manage your models, you can upload new ones or uh, publish your models or make them private and of course you can delete certain versions of the model. You can um, define a hierarchy among the among your models and to see um, the hierarchy just ask for a version tree. Here you can see which model depends on uh, which parent model and um, yeah, which, which child version emerged from which parent version. The initial version is highlighted in red, while the version you've selected is colored in blue. So let's modify the version tree and add another parent. And if you ask for the version tree again, you can see that this transcription inhibition version is uh, depends now on two other versions. Yeah, however, this is of course not the focus of Beavis and Butthead. We want to see the changes that occurred between two versions. Um, yeah, to compare two versions, you just select them and uh, click the compare button. And here you can see the um, uh, reaction network highlighted um, with the diff. Um, yeah, that's the diff I've used previously in my slides. Deletes are highlighted in red and uh, modifications in, are colored in yellow and inserts are blue. So. As you can see, one of the product is of the reaction was deleted and another reaction was inserted. By the way, the visualization is currently done using Cytoscape Web. Of course, uh, there may be some changes that cannot be visualized in the chemical reaction network. So we are producing an HTML report. And here you can see the summary of the changes that occurred between these two versions. As we already know, species E was um, inserted and reaction R was uh, modified. B isn't a product anymore, but E is. And uh, reaction S was also inserted. Yeah, this example is quite small and you might uh, identify the changes by examining the XML code, but it's getting really complex if the models increase in size. So let's have a look at the changes between two versions of a larger model. We've taken this model from the Biomodels database and as you can see, real-world models are far more complex. I already explained the reaction network, so let's have a look at the report. And here you can easily see that some parameters were deleted um, and lots of react reactions have changed. For example, here the reaction uh, is now reversible 
and some modif modifiers uh, were into introduced. And um, the kinetic law is also changed. In, in addition, some rules in the SBML model were deleted. All in all, you get a comprehensive summary of the changes. By the way, you might be happy to hear that uh, I've released a version with basic CellML support uh, some days ago. And so we are now also able to compare models encoded in CellML. One of our friends uh, provided some CellML models for testing. And here you can see the report of the CellML differences. It's a, a more or less a list of changed components, including variables that have changed, or variables that were inserted or deleted. And of course, we also display the mass if it was modified. By the way, before I forget, here you can see the output of Beavis. It's a diff encoded in XML, and the changes are divided into different sections, so such as updates or deletes, for example. Um, I think it's easy to see that it's hard to read, um, but lucky you, we've developed butthead. Okay, back to the presentation. Since we want to see our, uh, our tools integrated in existing platforms, um, we worked out some requirements. First of all, we are just able to compare models encoded in standardized formats, such as CellML or SPML, so no, body, no models hacked in MATLAB or whatever, please. Furthermore, Butthead needs access to all versions of a model. I think that's obvious. Otherwise, it cannot pass the models to Beavis to identify the changes. And last but not least, since our tools are implemented in Java, we need a Java-based web server. But this web server doesn't have to run on the repository server as long as Butthead is able to access the models. So if you're interested in using our tools, don't hesitate to drop me an email. OK, let's summarize what I've presented so far. We've implemented Beavis, a library for difference detection of computational models. And we also developed an interface to visualize the changes. Both tools are open source. You can download the binaries and the source code from our website. Furthermore, feel free to ask for an account um, to our prototypic implementation of Butthead. But keep in mind that we don't want to establish yet another platform. However, we want to extend existing tools to support the model S. So that's it. Thanks a lot for your attention. You can find our group on Twitter. Um, and as I already mentioned, our tools are uh, available um, from our website. Yeah, the yeah, prototype implementation yeah, of Butthead yeah, can be found yeah, here. Yes. Yes. It's quite hard, but uh, okay. So. Oh, okay. So we'll open up the floor then. Any questions for Martin? Uh... No.
So, so Martin, the, uh, um, the the software is that does that need to be compiled, or is that uh, able to be uh, sort of downloaded as a, uh, uh, a readily, you know, or already compiled uh, um, application? Um, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Um, Beavis um, is a library, so you library. can um, download the binaries and just and run it. Just run it. Um, find our. Um, it's quite confusing to find. Um, we can um, hear you fine. <laughs> Great. So here you can see uh, how you can uh, use Beavis. Just pass two XML files and you get an output uh, XML diff. And what head is uh, var file, so you can uh, just deploy it to Tomcat or some something else, some Java web server. Is it only for CellML models, or it's beyond? Pardon? Pardon? So the question was, uh, is it only for CellML models? But you mentioned it was for uh, uh, SBML. As yes, well. currently we support SBML and CellML. Any other questions? OK. Um, no more. Apparently. So thank you very much, uh, Martin. It worked very well from this end. So our next uh, speaker is Tommy Yu. And he will be giving a status report on uh, PMR2, continuing on the theme of uh, model repositories for physics. <laughs> Uh, I'm the developer behind uh, the Visium Log Repository uh, 2, uh, which is the currently is the uh, model repository used uh, for initially for the sun model repository, but it has since been extended to support uh, all kinds of different other model types, such as uh, FreeML support. Uh, and uh, what it has is um, it's a uh, it has two different major endpoints uh, with the uh, version control system backing for the model developers to uh, construct their models on, which is um, encapsulated as what we call a workspace. Uh, it's a full-blown version control system, discrete version control system built on top of uh, and it allows each individual versions of models uh, from, from this beginning to the state is now to be uh, presented and tracked. And, however, uh, this form of uh, model is not very replicable by uh, a biologist or any other uh, person interested in uh, visualizing a similar model. So uh, what we also combine to get care of the system is, is with a content management system which is uh, suitable for uh, presenting uh, graphics or other kind of uh, similar results that uh, biologists would be more interested in. And this set of presentation is what uh, we call exposure. And with the content management system in place, uh, we can also uh, provide uh, 
user access control um, so that uh, models or uh, the people who are managing the repository can keep the models secure uh, or other, other kinds of other permission systems that they want to implement. Um, and uh, TMR2 is built on top of a uh, plug-in system, uh, which means that uh, new additions to the repository, uh, new features at, to be added to repositories are implemented as a set of plugins. And this allows the Add, allows additional functions to the repository to be added with the uh, second core. And it's up to the uh, managers of, or the, actually, the administrators of the, of the administrator to enable the disable the functions that are designed, or they, they can implement new function, functionalities themselves. And next. And a little more about the version control system. Um, one of the uh, original goals of the uh, some more repository is to provide uh, version control access. Uh, in the previous version, or the initial, uh, let's just say, yeah, in the, in the initial version of the some model repository, the version control system was done in ad hoc manner, and that, that caused all sorts of problems because there was no strict control. Uh, this is why uh, we decided to uh, use a uh, well tested, um, well supported uh, version control system. And uh, the one that we had decided was Imperial because at, at that point in time it, it had the most friendly uh, Windows client, uh, which is uh, Turtoy's uh, HT. And another thing about uh, ha having a uh, distributed version control system is that it's uh, quite fault tolerant. So if whatever reason uh, the model repository was completely uh, wiped off the face of the earth, um, at least you'll still have the version on the desktops. <laughs> um, and um, Git is another distributed version control system, but uh, at that point in time, it was quite unfriendly to Windows users. But now it has gotten a lot better, so maybe you can support that with the same plugin-based architecture that uh, DMR2 provides. And again, like this is all encapsulated in the workspace, so this is like a sample view of it. Um, and uh, Moving on. And the presentation of models. Uh, like one of the ideas we think of our models as having uh, as things to provide to you, provide access to, to users. And uh, well, actually, I should say different views. Because um, like a model we have can, can be uh, visualized uh, in many ways. So, um, and because of this, um, we, we need some foundation that allows these views to be slotted in as the as the foundations are constructed. And we also have many different file types. We intend to support every single model types that the visiting project uh, creates, such as right now we're cell model and even support. Um, who knows what other languages there will be in the future. So um, Ultimately, um, this is why we had to, we had to have a robust uh, complementary system in place. And this one, we decided on the system form, um, which is a system that's been it's fairly well tested and which initially uh, done use for some of the more repository in the beginning. So that's why I just kept on using the system. And uh, a little more about the exposure plugins. So this is a screenshot of the uh, UML, or the I just say the, the Syncs Viewer, which is a visualizer plugin that you installs on, on their browser to uh, visualize um, UML models. And there's actually a two years ago uh, in uh, the Hackathon Harmony in New York, which is a Hackathon, uh, I have develop a primitive SVMO plugin on top of PMR2 to uh, render some basic, extract some basic information from the SVMO file and render some as an exposure page. And uh, other things that the model 
repository supports is that uh, there is a cross-platform math rendering uh, with the aid of the uh, MathJax uh, JavaScript libraries, and of course, there's some API for some of the vaults. And uh, even within the workspace, there are limited options to, to provide uh, visualization methods such as like images gets rendered as images rather than a series of <coughs> uh, binary strings. And uh, recently implemented features uh, on top of EMR2 is that um, we now have a wizard for uh, creating DPs on exposure uh, presentational views, which is a much more friendlier uh, method to doing so rather than just going through individual files and, and clicking over it. Now we have an overview of um, the entire exposure structure uh, for, for new users to uh, select and to use. And also uh, rudimentary web services, um, PMOG now uh, is able to um, provide these um, web service access to uh, list of all the exposures, all the workspaces in the repository. And uh, this is um, being further refined uh, right now as a staging server to make it uh, more adhere to the uh, REST for and hypermedia um, way of uh, presenting these web services. And uh, another thing is the import and export of functionalities in PMR2. Uh, with the distributed version of the control system, it is very easy to uh, exchange models between um, individual uh, modelers. And even now that we actually implemented features to exchange um, models between different repositories, in PMR2, you can directly import models from external uh, Mercurial repositories if you have the same input models on Bitbucket, uh, which is a Mercurial hosting provider, you can now uh, support. Um, so, it's like if you import, paste in the link to that uh, Mercurial um, repository and then click the import button and you import all the models, well, the entire history of that model into a workspace. And uh, the exposure, I mentioned the, wizards, the wizard uh, interface, that also allows the um, import and export. Those exposure structures. So, if we have multiple instances of PMR2, which we actually do now because we have a saving server, uh, it is possible to import and export these structures, these presentational views, uh, so that you can replicate them on uh, a different uh, instance of PMR2. And then uh, the feature, and uh, it's, the, it's the refinement of the uh, web service. Uh, and right now on the, on the staging server, we have a much more uh, restful, hypermedia oriented uh, web service, which is also uh, managed by the authentication is also managed by OAuth, uh, which is a uh, security specification uh, that the that that main internet uh, web based. Uh, Companies like Google and Facebook also get to have uh, created for uh, limiting access to, uh, through web services. So with OAuth, you can limit the set of permissions to uh, web clients so that uh, you can be sure that you are in control of your own data. Save your your uh, allowing other Web service access to data, you don't necessarily want them to change a password, for instance. <laughs> and uh, other work in progress is um, integration with other uh, web services, such as uh, the uh, Recorder project for the uh, network framework, or uh, even any other um, external uh, web service for indexing uh, models. And one of the most recent work that we did was uh, like over the past three years with, with was with Ron. Uh, there actually will be a demo of this here we go, uh, of the work that we recently did, um, which involves the uh, linkage of two different web services, one of which is PMR2, and the other one is the indexing service that we created. 
And uh, finally, once all of these um, web services start working through that, we'll just make uh, the models uh, more happy, I hope. And which will allow better uh, visualization options because you know PMRs can now have to do everything. They can, can then rely on other web services such as uh, Beavis and Butthead for uh, visualizing the history of models. Because right now PMR2 has relatively poor uh, history of visualization. Like you, if you go to the list of model history, you see this table, which means nothing to you. But with other web services that control through all these um, historical model data, it will be possible to uh, render them nicely for um, models to um, view. Um, and once we inco incorporate a uh, better RDF, um, let's say better semantic uh, data stores, we can then uh, do better reasoning um, of the model metadata and allow um, modelers or biologists to find the influence that they want quick, quicker. And of course, uh, continuing on with the workspace, it, uh, it, as, well, as more uh, modelers make use of this, it hopefully may, may allow a better collaborative model between uh, modelers and the models. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, when you implement your quarter against PMR and you say, for example, you use the Recordo ontologies to create concepts that you recommend in a model of your question, you put it back into the Recordo, how do you then, what's the synchronization of that extended set of ideas triples in the Recordo if it's been implemented here? How do you how do you synchronize what's happening here or what's happening elsewhere? Uh, there are a few things. If you if a model is actively working on a the model, they don't necessarily want to index its work. Uh, otherwise, uh, there, there might be too much synchronization going on, and then these results may confuse the overall graph. So what happens is this why I'm not usually just cause of exposures. So when, there, when the model is done, uh, the model is then flag uh, that model in 2000 for mid building exposure, which is then which creates then this uh, uh, you can call it that principles marking uh, that all as something to be indexed. So I would imagine that's that would be a good point because uh, that's a fair thing. Okay. So so hi uh, so I say you have deployed that Nordic tool is that Uh kind of. Right. Kind of. But uh, like the recorder work, uh, the, the innovation work, I had only just started uh, this past month. But, so I had the, I got the virtual store, the triple store, which is the same uh, triple store that the recorder project uses. And uh, in, in kind of integrated with PMR2, I can tell the recorder to index these RDF within the model repository, but that's, used, that's as far as right now. Right. But once the RDO is indexed, I imagine that the, once the code service kicks in, then they could go through that, those triples, and then do reasoning from that. Yeah, so at the moment, uh, is the knowledge base. Now, I'm distinguishing the knowledge base, which is where the ontology is yes. decide, from the RDO to the store. Yes. <clears throat> is there also a to have a local knowledge base, or is it plan to use knowledge base of services over uh, from PDI? Uh, we can talk about that later because I have no idea of this right. okay. But I imagine both can be supported. Now. I mean, if we have the infrastructure for that problem, I imagine that would probably run our own uh, infrastructure. Or, I mean, I did, I did mention that we, we can link different repositories together. So I, I, I imagine both approaches are viable. So, so tell me, if someone uh, wanted to develop a plugin for PMR2, how would they go about it? Uh, they could come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there are some documentations on, um, oh yeah, probably should have mentioned that um, all of PMR2 is open source. It's actually on GitHub. It's uh, GitHub slash 
GitHub dot com slash KMR2, that's where um, it starts. I had, uh, if you are interested in developing, right, you can start with your, like going through LinkedIn and tell me how bad I got the emotions. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, um, so I know everyone's trying to see how they can finally maybe do some searching in the model repository. But I thought I'd just briefly go through embedded workspaces. It's quite a powerful feature, I think, in the model repository. And no one really uses it. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm not sure if I'm going to do anything to convince you other than to maybe cross tool developers to, to provide action. Um, so, you just heard from Tommy about PMI workspaces, <laughs> and how the material repositories, you can stick whatever you want to that. Um, and it gives you the sort of detailed provenance of all the data that you store in that workspace. And then if you combine that with CellML 1.1, where I mean, you can build up a sort of hierarchy of reusable modular descriptions of mathematical, where you can import arbitrary bits of CellML from somewhere, use them, um, create uh, these totally awesome models that do all sorts of cool things. Uh, and then you know you can create these libraries of these modules that we all Sort of trying to work towards to make it easy for a non specialist to create new models um, to investigate their data. So that's the sort of where we're coming from with embedded workspaces. Um, and, and you have some problems when you do this. So if you're importing the existing model you know, from somewhere else in the repository or somewhere else on the internet, what happens if that changes? Um, you know, maybe the component names and stuff change, or, or file names change, and things like that, and it breaks what you do with it. Um, or maybe someone changes the parameterization of that model, you know, to change from, say, rat to human, and you're using it in your own rat model, and now it no longer um, sort of reproduces what you need. Um, so you need some way to, to solve it. Um, and similarly, if there's bugs that get fixed, you want to take advantage of those. Um, Quite good to crack the provenance across all these changes, so that you know your own work can be um, properly recognised um, by other people, and you recognise their work when they sort of fix things that help you. Um, you know, so it works both ways. Whether you're pulling in direction or pushing out direction from what you're doing with the models that you use. So one solution um, that we're, we're sort of using. Um, is embedded workspaces. Currently, it's done as material repositories. And I must say, when I first saw this, I was a little bit worried. Um, a feature of last resort that they really recommend you don't use. Um, <laughs> but, but I think the way we use Mercurial to manage these sort of mathematical models versus typical software projects managing code bases is a little bit different. And you can kind of um, skip over the worries. And perhaps if we have some best practice guidelines one day, um, that will help avoid any of the sort of big problems that we are supposed to create. Um, and so the problem with using this is you know, a little bit technical to, to use at present. You do have to work directly with material. Um, and you kind of need to know what you're doing. Um, although somehow you can muddle your way through if you Google enough stuff. So currently, if you have a workspace with embedded workspaces in it, the only thing I know that will show you anything is the, the website for the model repository, um, and that will sort of let you browse through the linked workspaces. But I don't know of any other software that will sort of present or make use of this. Um, 
other than you know sort of through this LML uh, model that you're using. And the advantage that this gives you when you embed workspaces into your workspace, um, everything is a relative URL. Um, so you don't need to worry about websites breaking or changing their domain names and things like that. Um, and it makes it much easier to sort of package up your work um, on your local files and give it to someone else if you want to. And then because you can embed a workspace in a workspace and then that workspace can be embedded in another workspace, you can build up these hierarchies to any sort of arbitrary depth. depth. Um, but you do need to be careful when you're doing this. Um, and typically, so when you embed a workspace in your own workspace, you're only concerned with that sort of top level. If you're starting to look further down at some of the details, there you're probably better off embedding those workspaces directly. Um, but that comes back to best practice. <coughs> it's still working well. So just to give an example, um, you have a model in your workspace, and in that you maybe import, you know, this like fancy variable definition uh, from somewhere else, and you just have this sort of relative URL in the HH folder get the gating variable of an XML document, and from that get this component and use it here in my model. Um, and then maybe if you're, you know, you're being good, you want to reuse the standard definition of physical constants that we have in the repository, so you also import that component. You want to use it then in your cell amount to define the model. So, yeah, there might be something off the bottom of this. Um, so, on, on your local file system, on your, your machine, what you're going to have then is a folder for your workspace. My model or something. And there you're going to have a folder HH, which will contain the scaling variable and whatever else is in that workspace. The physical constant, your own model. So we have this special HD sub file, and in there is where you have the definition to say that on your local 